Let's turn to a different case, a 51-year-old ex-smoker who has a history of a half pack per day for 25 years, quit more than a decade ago, and she has really almost no medical history before her presentation with lung cancer. And she actually presented with what appeared to be locally advanced non-small cell, had some pain in her right upper chest, had been very active and sledding with her family in the last winter and had a crash and thought that her chest wall pain was from that, but it didn't improve and she ended up getting a chest x-ray that showed a right upper lobe mass. This was followed by a CT that confirmed a three, three and a half centimeter apical mass and some moderately enlarged nodes in her aortopulmonary window. But no evidence of distant disease, and she had a fine needle aspirate of a right pretracheal node that showed non-small cell and did appear to possibly be a candidate for surgery, certainly great performance status and not obviously bulky disease. Underwent a mediastinoscopy that showed adenocarcinoma in multiple stations, including on both sides of the mediastinum. So seems to be a stage 3B patient, and this is her imaging, and as you can see from the PET CT that was ultimately done, has at least a suggestion of the involvement that was seen histologically from her mediastinoscopy. In terms of background, she works as an administrator in a local school system, really excellent performance status and no past medical history. Now, the wrinkle is that as she had been referred to me and a radiation oncologist, she had a planning CT for radiation that showed a new, rather small, right pleural effusion, and that was followed by a thoracentesis that unfortunately confirmed malignant cells. So this was no longer in the realm of treating for cure with chemo and radiation and is documented as more advanced disease. Interesting, her smoking history is kind of on the cusp of what is sometimes considered an oligosmoker, and I think actually that Dave and your colleagues in Boston have largely promoted this concept of smoking history not being just a binary never smoker or ever smoker, but that people with 10 or maybe even up to 15 pack years may have a pretty reasonable chance of some of these molecular markers that we think of more reflexively for never smokers. But she's got stage 4A disease by our new staging system and the known adenocarcinoma. I'll start with you, David, and ask pretty clear that you would want molecular markers, but which ones would you prioritize? And in particular, if she did not have tissue available, let's say that we had identified from her imaging that she had stage 4 disease but didn't have enough tissue available, would you feel strongly enough in favor of molecular markers to want to pursue an additional biopsy to get tissue before initiating treatment? A number of great questions there. First is I would prioritize EGFR because that's the only one that I think informs first-line treatment decision-making. You know, EML for out translocation is great, but the trial is only available for second line and beyond. So I think EGFR is really the one we want here and now. If there was not enough tumor tissue available, we talk to patients about getting rebiopsies, and we'll do this if they're willing, only if we can do so in a reasonably non-invasive way or when the test can otherwise be justified. So CT-guided needle biopsy, uh, thoracentesis, that I think is all fine. To put somebody through mediastinoscopy when a mediastinoscopy is not otherwise indicated I think is a tougher issue and is something that we haven't been doing routinely. But if there's tissue that we can get without having to put patients under any form of anesthesia, it's something we'll consider doing. Tom, what's your thoughts here? You know, I would agree with that. I think in our practice, on the one hand, if you look at the trials, it's sort of justified getting EGFR mutation testing in the setting that largely came from the IPASS study. And there they looked at patients who are either never smokers or sort of your oligo smoker definition of less than a 15 pack year smoking history and quit, I believe, more than 10 or 15 years ago. But I think in our practice, we're certainly testing the never smokers as well as patients who have stopped smoking and would probably go ahead and get an EGFR mutation. We tend, partly for trial reasons also, but we're getting at least three markers in most people if we have enough, which is the EGFR mutation, the KRAS and ALK. Although I think in terms of outside of a trial, I think the KRAS and the ALK are probably less helpful in the first line setting here. So particularly if we had limited tissue, I'd want to get an EGFR at least. Dave, you already addressed this issue of 
ALK rearrangement being a lower priority in the first-line setting because the clinical trials are really directed to more advanced settings. So that's not something that you would necessarily wait on anything for, correct? Exactly. How does KRAS status affect your clinical decision-making, whether it's first-line or later? I would say, on the one hand, if you look at the prospective studies that are out there, if you were contemplating an EGFR inhibitor like Tarceva, and you knew somebody had a KRAS mutation, for the most part, those patients do not respond to EGFR TKIs or drugs like Tarceva. And so from a standpoint of response, you would probably want to pick another agent. I think for survival, it's been a little tougher to show a difference. I think if you look particularly at the Saturn maintenance trial, it it appeared anyway to the extent that there was benefit. It didn't seem to matter that it was similar in the KRAS wild type as well as KRAS mutants. But I think for the most part, at least in our practice, if I knew somebody had a KRAS mutation, I would look for other options other than an EGFR TKI like Tarceva. I think in this patient in the first line setting, I think it's probably the least helpful because the decision point here is really between an EGFR TKI like Tarceva and chemotherapy. And and the biomarker that's really going to be helpful is the EGFR mutation. And, you know, if that's present, the likelihood is that they don't have a KRAS mutation. So I'm not sure it helps in the first line setting. In the second line setting or beyond, from a response rate, certainly it's helpful. Whether it helps with survival in terms of prediction is less clear. Dave, what's your take here? From our standpoint, I think KRAS has been of lower clinical utility. We published data on over 200 patients who had received Tarceva or Aresa first line and had been tested for both EGFR and KRAS. Obviously, the people with EGFR mutations did very well. What we saw with the KRAS data was interesting, and I think is a little contradictory to some other previous data, in that it kind of didn't matter what your KRAS status was. It was just the fact that you were EGFR wild type that was the negative predictor. And so it's not that the KRAS mutants did particularly worse than those who were wild type for both EGFR and KRAS. And so I'm not sure that KRAS affects my clinical decision making at any point right now. Looking down the line, certainly we're looking for things to inhibit along the KRAS pathway for clinical trials. But in terms of picking agents in a first or second line setting, I'm not sure that KRAS is really informing my judgment right now. So at least having a KRAS mutation doesn't mean that a patient should not or will not get an EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor second or third line with you. So I'd say this. I'd say that just the fact that they are EGFR wild types makes it less likely that they would certainly respond. And so we shouldn't think of it as they shouldn't receive an EGFR first line. If someone was KRAS mutant, would I be likely to use Tarceva in a second or third line setting? No, it probably would push me towards a more standard cytotoxic chemotherapy agent. Now, the other thing that we've seen, although admittedly it's in not a large, large number of patients, is that the patients who have an ALK rearrangement do not have an EGFR or KRAS mutation. So if you were to get EGFR and KRAS in the first-line setting or prior to first-line therapy, would detecting either of these mutations lead you to not bother pursuing an ALK rearrangement? Dave? I think it's too early to tell, to be fair. I don't think we have enough data from enough patients to be able to say how mutually exclusive these things are, especially EGFR and ALK. Because it's a similar patient group, I imagine we're going to pluck a few patients that are going to have both. It's too early to say. I think that certainly, given the percentages, we're probably going to find rare ones here and there. I think it is a very low clinical likelihood, but I wouldn't say never. That's just so early in the story. The initial view was they're mutually exclusive, period, but the more data you get, the blurrier that becomes. Tom, what's your take? You know, I would agree with that. We have the ALK studies, and we are screening people who maybe had a EGFR mutation or what have you, and realizing that the chances are low, but I think right now we're still, since we don't know the full story, I think it's still reasonable to try to screen somebody for a trial and see if you see the ALK translocation. So turning back to this patient, she received carboplatin and pemetrexid with bevacizumab, which is based on a trial that Tom was one of the lead investigators for and is now being studied in a much larger setting as a phase three. She tolerated this extremely well. She had no significant adverse effects, really had just a couple of days of transient fatigue, but very little limitation in her activities. And happy to see that after two cycles, she had a good partial response, 
not a complete response, but really a very gratifying response. And then no further interval change after a total of four cycles. And her performance status remains excellent, and she really doesn't have any significant cumulative toxicities. So she's gotten four cycles, and the question is, when would you change her treatment and what? Would you go to six cycles? Would you drop some of these agents? Or would you switch or would you just altogether stop and watch the patient? Tom, you were involved with some of this early work. What's your take? That's an interesting question. I think that, first of all, although our study, which was we went up to six cycles of all three agents and then our maintenance was a continuation maintenance where we kept both the Olympta and Avastin going as a maintenance strategy. And as you mentioned, that's being tested now in a randomized trial compared to the Carbotaxol Bev or Avastin with maintenance of Avastin. And so outside of a trial, though, I still look at it from the standpoint of here you are with somebody who's had four cycles of therapy. They have stable disease now after cycle four. Outside of a trial, the only patients I would go to six cycles of the standard chemotherapy would be somebody who has ongoing response. And in this patient who has stable disease after four, I probably would stop certainly the carboplatinum and the Olympta here. I think that when you look at the maintenance question, I try to look at it first from the standpoint of, is this somebody that I would want to keep on maintenance therapy, particularly if we were to consider going to maintenance, say, maintenance Olympta by itself? In that case, though, the trial was really a switch strategy, not a continuation strategy, as would be the case here. And I think short of getting the data from the randomized trial that's looking at this compared to the carbotaxol Avastin combination, I probably, if I were to continue anything, would continue the Avastin by itself. This is not somebody who I think I would want to continue a maintenance cytotoxic agent on like Olympta, and I don't think there's really evidence to justify, at least in this patient, continuing Olympta beyond this setting. And so if I were to go to maintenance, I probably would sort of follow what they did in the ECOG trial with Avastin and keep that going. It's a difficult decision. It's hard to say, but until we have the data from the randomized comparison, I certainly would not continue a doublet like Olympta and Avastin in a maintenance setting without the data that shows that it either prolongs survival and does so with a reasonable side effect profile. So more often than not, you'd stop at four cycles of the doublet rather than continue to six, yeah? I think that's fair. In this case, it's carbo-Olympta, but even with carbotaxol or carbo-Olympta, I probably would stop at four if you have stable disease after the fourth cycle. I think occasionally I might go to six and somebody who's got ongoing response, but here I would probably stop. It's interesting that we have routinely and almost always not returned to a first-line agent after stopping it at four to six cycles and then seeing progression. With Olympta, we have an agent that is pretty well tolerated on a cumulative basis. And if you were to stop it after four cycles and the person progresses two or three months later, would you just move on or would you consider that the patient might go back to Olympta either alone or with, I don't know, either as the next treatment or sometime in the future? I guess the question is, have they exhausted their benefit with this agent or some other after four cycles, or could we maybe be discarding an agent earlier than needed? Another good question. I think that I will admit that in some settings, really it depends to me on how long a period of time was their disease controlled off of therapy. And I've had patients who were able to go six months or beyond where I felt that they never failed the agent. And because it's such a well-tolerated drug, I have tried to go back to it. And I think this is the only drug where I would consider that. And I have had some people respond again. And so it's limited numbers and no data to really point to. But I don't think it's unreasonable to consider that. I would say my enthusiasm for that strategy would be lower if it were two months or three months down the road as opposed to, say, six months or beyond, but that's subjective. I think it'd be reasonable in some patients to cycle back to it. The question to me is the timing. Dave, what's your approach here? Again, I think that the phase three trial of Carbotax Avastin versus Carbolimtavastin is tremendously interesting. And as Tom mentioned, the maintenance strategy in that trial for those folks who got Carbolimtavastin is to continue on with both the Olympta and the Avastin. We don't have good data to support it, but it certainly is intriguing. In general, I'm not continuing with the doublet as maintenance, though have I done it in selected patients? The answer is yes. I think for those patients who have had tremendous responses to the initial combination and who are of such good performance status even after four to six cycles, have I considered it and actually done it? The answer is yes. You know, ultimately, I think at this point, you're asking yourself the question, has the regimen been very effective? Do I think that they can tolerate it on an ongoing basis as a maintenance 
drug or combination? And if the answer to both those questions is yes, I'd think about doing it. So if they've had a very good response and an ongoing response, I don't want to lose that. And if I think that they can tolerate the combination of Olympta and Avastin together in a way, not just for another two or four more cycles where they're gutting it out, but really can do this for months if indeed the disease remains stable for that period of time, then what I think about doing it, the answer is yes. Yeah, it's interesting. One of the trials that was presented at ASCO was the French trial by parole and colleagues that had everyone getting cisplatin and gemcitabine for the first four cycles and then being randomized to observation alone, continuing the gemcitabine as a continuation maintenance or switch maintenance to Tarceva. Both of the maintenance arms had an improvement in progression-free survival, a little more striking with the gemcitabine, but significant for both, and then a not that impressive improvement in overall survival, although preliminary results. What was interesting to me was there wasn't any evidence that the continuation was less effective than an FDA-approved switch maintenance. And the benefit was most pronounced in the patients who had responded well to the cisplatin gemcide being in the first line setting. And to me, it's just interesting in that it suggested that the patients who got the most benefit haven't necessarily exhausted all of their benefit after four cycles, and there may still be some life left in it. Certainly, it's not going to be for everybody, but it got me scratching my head about some of our truisms about stopping after four to six cycles because you've necessarily reached a point of diminishing returns. And also that we have so little data on the concept of continuation maintenance, at least this suggests that it's potentially comparable to our FDA-approved and a little better studied switch maintenance strategies. I think we've seen patients, and if this individual had sort of ongoing response where they were clearly benefiting, I do think there's a situation where you would continue, and you might in that individual drop the carboplatin just to avoid the myelosuppression. You'd like to see some, as you sort of said, the people who kind of get ongoing benefits, some clear evidence that they are in fact continuing to get better to sort of justify keeping them going on a cytotoxic agent. Thanks. Thanks. 